today. We want to welcome you to Christ Central. It's so good to see all of our regular attenders. We want to welcome those who are tuning in, in at our North Campus in Dallas, those that are watching online, those that are looking and watching on LifeLink, as well as those that are listening by radio. Christ Central, just make everybody feel welcome as they join us today. <laughs> Hallelujah. Last week I talked about faith, and that's just been turning over in my spirit, just this this message of faith and of stretching us. And uh, I know that, uh, I know and realize that we can walk with God and that we can live in faith and that we can be saved and on our way to heaven, but there are different levels of faith. And that's why he talked about that he's taking us from uh, levels of faith to faith or from glory to glory, that we are on this journey. And I believe, and, and what the Lord was dealing with me about is there's a lot of people who, though they have salvation, are living life safe. They're not taking risks. They're not living on the edge of faith or in the lane of faith. They're running their race, but they're also not running at the full capacity for which they have. I think we've all been guilty at times of doing that. But uh, I also believe that there are people who uh, have a natural tendency to stretch their faith and to live on the edge. And anybody that has really ever made a difference in this world, that's ever made a, a change, anybody that's ever really uh, went to new territories or broke new grounds, they have had to have faith and they couldn't play it safe. As I was reading this week, I, I was looking and reading some stories, and one of those stories is about a, a man that we're all familiar with. Uh, his name is Chuck Yeager. Chuck Yeager was a World War II hero, and uh, he had in his mind that he wanted to break the sound barrier, the speed barrier in a plane. And everybody who had tried it before him had came to the place at a certain place where the, the, the plane would literally shake violently and begin to disintegrate and come apart. As a matter of fact, uh, many of the pilots who had tried, the plane had literally came apart if they didn't back off on the throttle and it had disintegrated and many pilots had died. And, and so Chuck Yeager had uh, wanted to, to break the sound barrier. And so he had had it all planned for October. October of 1947. And so he is uh, preparing for it in just a few days or weeks before he is to make this a uh, run. Uh, all of a sudden, he's on a, a riding, riding a horse. He gets thrown. He breaks some ribs. Everybody tells him, you can't do it. It's too taxing. But yet, there was something on the inside of him that just drove him. And he said, I've got to do it. I know we can do it. I believe we can do it. And so he gets in the plane. He's in pain. But yet, he pushes through it. And they drop him out. And he goes. And when he gets to about 700 miles an hour, he talks about how the plane literally begins to shake almost out of control. It begins to violently uh, uh, began to disintegrate. He continues instead of backing off, he runs the throttle up and he pushes through and he says after all of that, that chaos in that moment, all of a sudden when he broke through, all of a sudden there was peace, tranquility and a deep calm. Listen, there's sometimes the devil don't want you to break through certain, certain levels of your faith walk. And he's going to cause turmoil and trouble and the world will shake all around you. But that's not the time to back off of your relationship to God. That's to put the throttle down, to put the hammer down, and you just keep pushing. And you're going to break through into the peace and the tranquility of a living God. <laughs> Hallelujah. As I was reading that, I couldn't help but be challenged by what he was saying because I really believe that God is wanting us to not play it safe but to really walk in faith. He's been dealing with that and as I was reading there was a, a, a verse that jumped out of the Bible. I, I'd never really noticed it before and it piqued my curiosity. I began to look into the scripture and I've got a, a short message for you today. Turn to somebody and say I've heard that before. But the names in the Bible, sometimes when the Bible mentions a name, there's, very, there's a lot of significance to it. But if you don't have a lot of history or a lot of, of the story, uh, you don't really understand it. And I've read about uh, this man before, but it's only mentioned twice in Scripture. And it is out of the, out of the book of Judges. And, and we're going to look in Judges 5 and in Judges chapter 3. But it was a, a, a judge of that day, uh, was a biblical judge. He was a, a military ruler, but also a, a spiritual leader in, in Israel. And God used them to help lead the people before he had began to instill a king. Because the people later on decided they want a king. But before they had a king, and after they had come out of Egypt into the promised land, they had these men and women called judges. And uh, after the conquest of Canaan, it was around 1150 and all of that, 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 that Saul and, and the kingdoms began. But before that, they had these men and women called judges. The government 
of uh, Israel was formed by tribes. They had no centralized government to speak of. It was a confederation of these different tribes. And in times of crisis or in times of attack, many times God would raise up a leader from among them. And uh, not only would these people be judges, they would be military leaders. And the book of Judges mentions many of the judges, and some of them you're familiar with, some of them you're not. Uh, there was one called Othniel and Ehud and Shamgar and Deborah and Gideon and Tola and Jar, uh, Elon, Abaddon, even Samson. These were men and women that God had raised up as judges in Israel. Even in the first book of Samuel, Eli and Samuel were considered judges, though one was a priest and one was a prophet. God used them. Uh, to help lead the nation of Israel. And I was reading, uh, and in the fifth chapter of Judges, there was a, 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 a Deborah, I, who was the uh, spiritual leader, she was a judge and she was a prophetess, begins to sing after a victory that had been, came. And then there's a song, and in one of the verses of the song, it makes reference to a condition that the people of Israel were living in and about uh, a couple of the people who had brought about deliverance or the change in the nation or the revolution that happened in Israel. And it got my attention, and so I began to look into it and to try to discover exactly who these people were. God brought Israel out of Egypt into the Promised Land. We know that. And uh, he told them to kill the giants to run out the people who had inhabited this land, this promises. The only thing between them receiving all that God had for them in the promised land were these giants and these people. But God had told them that if you will go into the land and fight for it, I will surely give it to you because it's your inheritance. I've promised it to you. You just got to show up and be right with me and I'm going to give you the victory. But they did. They went into the land and we find that they fought and they won victories and they took some territories. But then they began to settle. They began to compromise. They began to uh, not run people out but to make deals with people. I've shared a little bit about that with you in the past. But in this case, all of a sudden, over the years, those people that they had compromised with began to grow stronger. Even they began to be such friends with the Israelites that their children began to intermarry with those who were not in covenant with God. And all of a sudden, Israel, their heart began to shift from the God uh, Jehovah. They began to shift to other gods and began to worship. And when that would happen, God would become angry and God would remove his blessings and remove remove his protection and he would allow judgment and the nations that were around Israel would get stronger and then they would come to war and they would conquer them and then they would make them slaves or pay tribute they would let them be in the land but they would steal all of their increase they would they would cause them to pay tributes or taxes and and they began to uh, do this and they began a cycle and then that would happen in uh, 20 or 40 years into it then Israel would repent before God they would cry out to God and God would raise up a deliverer and there would be a revolution and Israel would go and, and win back in a military conquest their independence again and they would everything would be good again in the land and then they would slowly go through the cycle again and again where they would backslide and we look at it through this uh, lens of history and we wonder why in the world would people continue to serve God when things are good and all of a sudden get things good and then they would backslide and then their life fall apart and they go back into bondage and, and then they would see the cycle and 40 or 60 years later they would need another revolution and, and we look back and we say man these people just didn't learn it but can I tell you that there are people even in this room today who are in that kind of a cycle testing one two testing one two I'm bringing it home now come on the reality is that we have a tendency in our human nature that in crisis we turn to God because we realize our limitations. We realize that we don't have the power to save ourselves. We don't have the power to meet the needs in our body or in our physical need or even in our emotional need or our, our family's needs. There are times of crisis where we turn to God because we know He loves us and He has the power to help. And then as He delivers us and He brings us and He restores us and those things, if we're not careful, we began to slip back away and not be as passionate in our prayer life and not as passionate in our worship. Let me tell you something. If you want a passionate prayer life, you just need to get in a crisis. Come on, can I get a witness from somebody? Because that causes us to realize our limitations and about how big God is. But the reality is he never called us to be in one day and out one day. He's called us to be faithful every day. Can I get a witness in this house today? Hallelujah. 
Because God loves us and wants us to live this abundant life, this purpose-filled life, a life of love, a life of significance, not a life of fear, not a life of worry, not a life of powerlessness, but he wants us to live a life of power and purpose. And in this verse I was reading, and I've only got a couple of verses, but in Judges, the fifth chapter, Deborah's singing this song of victory and is making reference to the people of God who lived in such fear. She was talking about that before this revolution, before this war, there was such fear and trepidation in the people that they were not walking in the places that God had gave them. And they chose instead to live safe lives, lives of of safety instead of living lives of faith. It mentions a couple of people key people that change that, but one of the verses just jumped out at me, and I just want to share it. In Judges chapter 5, verse 6, it says this, in the days of Shamgar, son of Anath, and in the days of Jael, people, listen, people avoided the main roads, and travelers stayed on winding paths. As I continued to read, that kept stirring in my heart. I went back and I read it again. And in that verse, what it's stating and what it's revealing is that if you were a Jew living in the promised land during the time that the Philistines had taken a, a control and conquered you, that even in those days that people would not walk on the main roads in their own country because of the fear of all the Philistines that were on the road. And when the Philistines would come across you on the road, they would rob you you steal and beat you and possibly even kill you and so because even though they were in covenant with God and even though they had been saved from Egypt they were living in a promised land but not walking in any of the promises I don't know who I'm talking to today but they were living in a land that God had given them and they were still in covenant with God but because they weren't walking in faith they were winding on the back roads and in the pathways and they would not get on the main roads you could could not take the quickest road. You could not take the fastest and easiest route. You were too fearful and too scared. The Philistines had terrorized the Jewish nation to the point that they didn't even walk on main roads. They snuck around in the back pathways and they couldn't really do business like they needed to. They, they couldn't live in freedom of traveling in their own nations because the enemy had caused them to live in such fear and intimidation to rob them and beat them. And I've just come to tell you that I I minister to people all the time and I see believers and Christians who really have been redeemed and you're saved and you've been brought out of of bondage and you're on your way to heaven and yet even in your new life and even in your redeemed life you are living in fear and in bondage. You're living with sicknesses and diseases. You're living with depression you don't have to live with. You're living with no vision and no power and I've just come to tell you you don't have to live like that. You You can get on the road of faith for he came that you could have life and have it more abundantly. Give God a hand clap of praise. People avoided the main roads and they traveled these winding paths. In other words, the enemy had God's people so intimidated they could not walk in what God had given them. And they couldn't occupy the places that God, because fear drove them from their rightful place to the back alleys and to the winding paths, wasting valuable time and limiting what they could do and where they would go. While the Philistines, the enemy, walked in the places that they were supposed to occupy. As I thought about that, the Spirit of God began to move within me and share with me that this is still the enemy's strategy. He's not changed. He is still a bully. He's still an intimidator. He still wants to move against us and cause us not to receive and walk in the things that God has for us. He wants you to believe that just because you're saved, he first of all, he wants you to question your salvation, that whether you're really saved. And if you have got enough faith to understand that you are saved by grace and not by works. When you get to that place, then he wants you to say, well, you may be saved, but God can't use you. There's no power in your life. There's no anointing in your life. You may get saved, but it's going to be barely and by the skin of your teeth. Has anyone ever heard that from the enemy in your life? 
You can't really do what Pastor Lonnie talks about. You can't really be a witness. You can't really lay hands on the sick. You can't really make a difference in the world. You're just going to have to hold on till Jesus comes. You're just going to have to sit down and be quiet in your nation. They don't want to hear uh, you talk about Jesus. They don't want. You're just going to have to go on the winding back roads. Don't you come out to the public forum and don't you stand up in public and be it. Don't you come out here. You just go on in the back rooms. But I've come to tell you, I'm standing on the main street and I'm declaring Jesus Christ is Lord. I'm declaring he's the hope of a nation. You see, you see the reality is that sometimes that the devil wants us off the path of God. When you and I get saved, Jesus is called the way the truth, and the life. In other words, there is a way that leads into righteousness and holiness and eternal life. And there is a way that will lead to death and destruction. And when we get saved, God sets us on the right way. Come on, amen? As a matter of fact, the psalmist writes in Psalm 139, he says, search me, O God, know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts and point out anything, any, anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. In Deuteronomy it says, For I command you this day to love the Lord your God, to walk in His way. Somebody say walk in it. And to keep His commands and, de de and decrees and laws. Then you will live and increase. And the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to possess. In Ephesians he writes, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God pre prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And here's what I've got to tell you over and over in Scripture. The Bible said that the steps of the righteous are ordered of the Lord. In other words, He's got a path for us to walk walk in a destiny a place and a purpose and when you and I began to walk in it all of a sudden by faith things began to happen our anointing grows our maturity happens the promises of God and the provisions of God are on the path that he is destined and the devil knows it so his job is to get you off the path that God prepared come on somebody and so you can be saved, but yet living in bondage because you're not walking in the ways of life. He has prepared a way. And fear is one of the tactics the enemy uses to cause you not to fulfill or walk into your purpose. Timothy, that's why Timothy, it says, for I've not given you a spirit of fear. In other words, if you are scared, it is not of God. You can mark it in, in your head that that's not God. For I have not given you a spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of a sound mind. God wants warriors who are full of faith and not full of fear. Can I get a witness this morning? Come on, give him a hand clap of praise. The enemy wants to intimidate us to live these intimidated, fearful lives, worried about our safety and security, more about our destiny. Walking in destiny will cause you to come face to face with your enemy. God allows enemies on your path not to bring fear into our lives, but to build greater faith in our lives. David did not face Goliath because God wanted to intimidate him. God wanted to prove something to him and to all the people. If you will stand for me I will stand with you come on something and no weapon formed against you will prosper the, the scripture identified two people Shamgar and Jael now Jael I knew I had knew about her it was she was a woman she was the wife of a man named Heber who had killed a Philistine general the general had uh, been on the battlefield and he had an army, a, a fierce army of 900 iron chariots. And, and all of a sudden they had led this, the prophetess Deborah had got a word from God, shared it, and they had went down to the battlefield. He had came with his 900 chariots, this general. He had been defeated by Israel. He had jumped from his chariot and he had ran from the battlefield. He had ran uh, as he was uh, leaving and, and they had killed everyone else and then they began to look for the general. The general ran down the roads and after he being weary and tired from the battle and from running, he's running by on a road and this lady, Jael, uh, looks out and sees him running and she waves to him and he uh, and offers him to come into the tent to rest. She com He comes into the tent. She, he says, uh, are you got anything to drink? She gives him some milk, some warm milk and then 
then he's tired and she says you can lay down and he lays down and she puts a blanket over him and he said listen people are looking for me so if anybody comes looking for me I want you just to tell them nobody came and nobody's here and, and so she walks out he falls into a deep sleep and she takes a spike a, 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 a spike that held down the tent and a hammer she sneaks back into the tent and gets over him and drives the spike through the general's temple and pins his brain to the ground. That's one reason, men. God says, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. An angry woman's a dangerous thing, my friend. All you men are going to be sleeping with one eye open, dog. I'm going to make sure, honey, I'm going to get you flowers tomorrow. And so they're singing her praises because when the troops come and all the men in the battlefield come looking for him, she says, he's right in here, fellas. Come on, somebody. Can I tell you that a, a, a godly woman is an adversary for the devil because she is sensitive to the spirit and God will use her and come on, amen? A praying woman is a powerful woman in the kingdom. Come on, amen? I don't even have time to go there because she ain't what I'm talking about. But I know about her and I knew about her, but I'd never heard about Shamgar. There's only one other scripture that mentions him in all the Bible. And he is one of the main reasons that the people of Israel got over their fear of walking on the highways and, and, and began to travel back on the highways. But it find out as I studied, he's a farmer. He was a man of faith, but he was not a soldier. He's not a warrior. He's a farmer, but in Judges chapter 3 and 31, it says something about this farmer. It says in, in, in Judges 3 and 31, after Ehud, uh, talking about another leader who died, Shamgar, son of Anath, rescued Israel. He once killed 600 Philistines with an ox goat. As I looked at that and, and began to say, what is the connection? The only time he is mentioned is when the roads could not be passed. And, and now it t says that he was part of the reason of the victory of the, of the people of Israel. And the only other scripture says that at one time he killed 600 Philistines with an ox goad. And, and as I looked at it and began to look at it, he's a farmer. And he got tired of living in fear. He got tired of not being able to take his crops where they needed to go. He got tired of living below what God had told him. He got tired of his family after sneaking around and worried about his children getting killed or raped. And he got tired of the enemy trying to rob him of his stuff. And all of a sudden, one day, this gentleman made up his mind that I'm getting on the highway and I'm going to walk on the highway. And he took his oxen because an ox goad was about an eight-foot-long staff. And on that staff, on one end, it had a metal tip. And on the other end, it had a metal paddle. The tip was for when you were driving the oxen, you would goad them and you would poke them and you would steer them. But the paddle was when you got to the end of your row after you had plowed that you took the paddle and you would flip it around and you would clean the hoe or the plow off again and you would begin to. And so for years, this farmer had handled this stick. He had cleaned the plow and he had goaded the thing. He didn't have a sword and he didn't have a, he had been not to war college and he had never been trained in the art. But what he knew was, I'm a child of God. I may be a farmer, but God told me this is my land. Come on, somebody. And so one day, he got on the road with his ox. And he took his ox goad. And as he was going down it, all his friends said, don't get on the road. They're going to kill you. They're going to steal your stuff. He had got full and tired and sick and tired of living in safety he had made up his mind this is God's promise I'm tired of living like we're living and he began to drive his oxen he came upon a large group of Philistines that were amazed because the roads were were uh, uh, deserted and they look at this farmer and they said look at him we're gonna steal his oxen we're gonna kill him we're gonna take him and we're gonna teach them that they can't be these are our roads we have conquered them they're our people. But they didn't know that that day they were meeting a, meeting a farmer that wasn't just any farmer. 
They were coming face to face with a covenant man of God that had had enough. I don't know who I'm talking to in this place, but you got to get to a place where you're tired of living in safety and it's time to live in faith. Come on, amen. And he took, as they came at him, he took that staff and he killed 600 soldiers in one battle. I can't get no help here. He hadn't been to seminary. He didn't have pastor in front of his name. He didn't have prophet in front of his name. He didn't have priest in front of his name. He got tired of living in a city where people would not uh, recognize who they were in God. And so he made up his mind. I'm not walking another day on these winding back paths. God gave me this land. I'm a child of God. This is a possession he told me. This is the promises of God. And I'm walking on the highway. I'm going to Main Street. I'm doing doing what I got to do. Come on, somebody. I don't know about you, but that caused me to shout right there in my house. I said, when I get to heaven, I'm going to walk up and just high-five this farmer and say, you are bad mamma jamma. Is anybody hearing what I'm talking about? Because the Bible said that he inspired because after that he began to walk the roads. I can't get no help. And the people watched him and said, I want you to look at that farmer. If that farmer can do it, we can do it. And they got their stuff, and they began to take back their road. See, it don't take a lot of people. It just takes somebody that's going to believe in the promises of God. How many of you are tired of living in safety and you want to walk in faith? You want to receive the promises of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I looked at this, and, and just real quickly, there's three things that he did that I believe caused him to move from safety to faith, from the safe lane to the, fa- to the faith lane. He started where he was. See, he wasn't a soldier. He, he was a farmer. He had a family. He didn't go away and, and, and do. He started right where he was. He walked out on the highway closest to his house and he began to walk by faith. He said, if it's going to change, if I'm going to have to clear the highways, I'm going to clear it right in front of my house. I want my wife to be able to go to the store without worry. I want my children to be able to go to school without worry. I'm tired of living as, a, as some kind of a, a hermit. We are going to take back what God's given us. I, as I was looking and listening, I was reminded even about the founder of Domino's Pizza. Turn to somebody and say, everybody love pizza. The the leader of uh, of the pizza uh, foundation of Domino's is Tom Mahonigan. He started in 1960, and and he started in one little hole in the wall shop. And and eight years he struggled and struggled, and even uh, uh, and the eighth year it burned down, and people told him to quit. And, and uh, when the insurance paid, they only paid him one cent on the dollar. He found himself $1.5 million in debt and had this burning dream, and it looked like it was so far away from him. He was working 100 hours, and in 1971... He was in debt to that $1.5 million, but he decided that he was going to make some changes. He believed that he had a destiny to become a, a pizza f- a mogul. And so what he did is he decided to take everything off the menu and just to focus on pizza. He did something that was revolutionary. He, he began to do free delivery. Is anybody hearing me? And all of a sudden, that little struggling pizza place began to explode because he pushed on through the pain. Today, there is over 6,100 domino franchises in America and in other countries. That man that was in debt, that man that struggled for a dream, now is one of the wealthiest men in America. Why? Because he kept fighting until he broke through. There's still a place in America where the people of God have got to keep on pressing until we have a breakthrough. We need revival in America. We need revival in our schools. We need revival in the homes. Come on, somebody. Give God a hand clap of praise. We have to be prepared. This is the season and this is the time. That's why 2 Timothy said, preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage. That means be prepared and ready to go no matter what happens because the season is going to change. If you're in a bad season, just hold on and keep walking. The season's going to change. If it's raining right now, just keep on. The sun's going to come out. If there's lack right now, you just keep walking because God's got provision on the pathway. You just 
just keep walking by faith. If you're sick right now, trust me, there's healing on the pathway. Just stay on the promises of God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. The second thing he did, he not only started where he was, but he used what he had. He was a farmer, and he was very familiar with that tool, that ox goat. He didn't have swords and spears. He had not been trained in that. But he was good and skillful at handling what he had been given. And listen, there's a lot of people that think they got to have a certain set of skills and all of those things. And I believe in applying ourselves and learning and growing and maturing. But you don't wait till you get everything till you start. You start right where you are and with what you got. Come on, somebody. See, you can get on that faith way today. Your faith can grow in you today. The day he took his ox goat and he went to the highway, he didn't do it with a lackadaisical attitude. He knew what he was going to be facing, but he went out with an intensity and an enthusiasm. He got fired up. Can anybody get fired up in here today? And he said, I'm going to walk in the place that God has prepared for me. The word enthusiasm comes from the word entheos, and it means in God or possessed by a God. And the reality, if you're a believer, you should be in God or God should be in you. Come on, somebody. When we walk by faith, we don't walk in our own ability, but we have partnered with the Spirit of God. That's why the Spirit comes in you when you get saved, because He knows that we need the Spirit to build our faith. Come on, somebody. And that's what the difference maker is you're not going to live and walk in faith and and access the promises of God because of your brilliance because of your natural talent or because of your personality can I get a witness David didn't become the king that conquered all the lands because of his uh, beautiful ability or his strength or his natural ability. But it says that God came upon him and God taught his fingers to fight and he created him for war. And because of that, he operated and functioned in the anointing of a warrior. Come on, somebody. You have been anointed to live in Lake City in 2012. You weren't anointed for another place or another time. And what you got to do is you've got to unleash what's on the inside of you. Let the Holy Spirit lead you and guide you because when you face your enemy, you can't do it. But the Spirit of God in you is more than able. Come on, somebody. You see, you got to start where you are and you got to use what you had. Mother Teresa had people in from all over the world come to India, to Calcutta, to see and experience her great ministry there to the poverty stricken. And they would come, and of course, they would be so uh, uh, overwhelmed by the ministry that many people would tell her, I'm going to sell everything I've got, and I'm going to move here, and I'm going to devote my life with you in this place. And she would stop them, and she said, you don't need to come here. You need to find your own Calcutta. In other words, Calcutta, we got this handled. Anybody hearing me? But what you need to do is you need to let this be an inspiration to you that you go back to your home and where you live. And if you look around, you'll find the hurt, the broken, the needy. And if you'll just look a little bit, you can be God's hands extended there. You can find your own Calcutta and you can make a difference. You got to start where you are and you got to use what you got. And the third thing he did is he did what he could. He started at his house. He used what he had. He fought every enemy he came across. And because of that, he started a revolution and changed a nation. He did. He didn't worry about people telling him he was just a farmer. See, so you got to get, you, get, you can't listen to everybody that talks to you. I'm going to talk over here. I don't know if y'all got it. Come on. I'm telling you, you got to be careful. You can't listen to everything your family tells you. You can't listen to everything your friends tell you. You can't listen to everything the news will tell you. What you better do is get along with God and find some godly friends and some godly people walking on the highway of faith and say, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. I'm going to walk in faith no matter what happens. I'm going to believe God. I'm not going to be quiet about what he's doing in me. Because people who think they know don't know. A college professor, I want you to listen to this. I cracked up about this. At Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia, one of the speech professors, after Martin Luther King gave a speech in his class, wrote on Martin Luther King's paper, Martin, if you continue to use such lofty words and flamboyant language when speaking, you will never be very effective at public speaking. 
I, I thought about that and I said, can you imagine Dr. King standing up with a million people and he gives an I, I have a dream speech. And can that professor sitting at home watching it on the TV? I'm going to tell you the lofty words in the flamboyant speech did pretty good. Come on, somebody. He changed a nation. He changed a heart. Why? Because he didn't let them affect what his destiny was. He said, I'm going to do what God called me to do. You may be a professor, but I'm serving God, and I'm going to, I'm going to use what he gave me. This is how I talk, and this is how I preach, and I'm going to share a message with a hurting nation. Come on, somebody. See, to make a difference, we can't stay in the safe lane. Sometimes it's easy to coast. We get stuff. We seem like we can coast. We, we can uh, uh, come to church, and we're not in too bad a shape, and the church is good, and the, and the people are doing good, and, and, doing, and all of a sudden we get in this safe coasting lane. God never called us to coast. He never called us to just worry about our safety. He's called us to make a difference and to walk by faith. Fear will attract Satan like faith will attract God. Jesus didn't die for us to live in fear or bondage, but he died that we could have a life of freedom and liberty. When God gives you and I an opportunity, it's a gift to us. What we do with that opportunity is our gift back to God. In Corinthians, come on, Pastor Luke. Nobody moving, please, except the team and Pastor Luke. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, I want you to listen to this scripture. He wrote this. Paul, he said, don't you realize that in a race everyone's running, but only one person is going to get the prize. So you run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away. But we do it for this eternal prize. So I run with purpose every step. I'm not shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I may be disqualified. You see, when we talk about this road of faith, this path of faith, this thing God prepared for us, it doesn't stop just when our life ends. God has a way, a way that we are to live in this life and in the next. I want you to listen to what Isaiah said, talking about the millennium. That's when Jesus comes back. Jesus sets up a kingdom, and we're living in unity with him. It says this in verse 8, And a great road will go through that once deserted land. Talking about Jerusalem and Israel. And it will be named the highway of holiness. Evil-minded people will never travel on it. It will be only for those who walk in God's ways. Fools will never walk there. Lions will not lurk along its course, nor any ferocious beast. There will be no dangers. Only the redeemed will walk on it. And those who have been ransomed by the Lord will return. They will enter Jerusalem singing, crowned with everlasting joy. Sorrow and mourning will disappear, and they will be filled with joy and gladness. A highway of holiness. That's a highway of being complete. In other words, God, the word holiness means complete. See, he's trying to heal our spirits. He's trying to heal our mind. He's trying to heal our soul on this journey. And when you and I get uh, saved, we begin to walk on this faith road. And the enemy's trying to push us off. Quit walking. Quit growing. Quit maturing. Let me tell you why, because he knows that as the people of God, if you ever get to the maturity level, that you say, no matter what comes down this road, I'm not getting off this road. I don't don't care what the enemy sends down this road. I don't care if cancer reports come. I don't, don't care if financial woes come. I don't care if relational problems come. I'm staying on the road. I'm going to walk this road. Because this is the highway of holiness. Because on this road, he's healing me. On this road, he's fixing me. On this road, he's restoring me. And see, if you just keep walking this road, one day you're going to step on this road of faith. You'll step from this life and not miss a beat. And you'll step from this life to the next and still be on the highway of holiness. And see, on that way, 
All of a sudden, we've been fighting our enemies in the natural. But when we step into the spirit, God has already removed all the spiritual battles on the other side. And so there's no more enemies there. There's no more wickedness there. There's no more ferocious beast that she's going to attack you there. You see, but on this side, he said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. The Bible said Samson was on the road. And a lion came up. And the Spirit of God came upon him. And he ripped him asunder. Let me tell you something. You're going to face some stuff on this road. But you've got to make a choice. I'm not getting into the safety of the bushes and the byways and the winding paths and end up at the end of my life and have never fulfilled my destiny because my destiny is not there. My destiny is on this road of faith. I'm going to run my race. And when I cross the finish line, I'm going to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant.